Really happy to see our all-star colleagues from the Mayo Clinic with Arjun Sebastian and Ahmed Nasser uh, talk about something that is so germane to our fusion practice and bone healing elements of our uh, surgical specialty, uh, that is actual bone graft science. So it's really cool to have this topic uh, presented by your group and Dr. Sebastian, Dr. Nasser, take it from here and introduce us to your speakers. Uh, thanks, Jens. Um, I'm Margin Sebastian, one of the orthopedic spine surgeons here at Mayo Clinic, um, joined by Dr. Ahmed Nasser, one of my senior partners, and our two fellows, Dr. James Bernance uh, and Dr. Brian Goh. And uh, I think uh, obviously a great topic for today, uh, talking a little bit about bone graft um, and uh, one that's obviously salient to all of our practices. Um, so I think we'll just jump right into it um, and let Dr. Go lead us off with the first article, which will be on the comparative clinical effectiveness and safety of BMP versus autologous iliac crest bone graft and lumbar fusion, the meta-analysis and systematic review. All right, great. <clears throat> great. Thanks, Dr. Sebastian. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, so as Dr. Sebastian said, I'm Brian Go. I'm one of the spine surgery fellows here at the Mayo Clinic. And today we'll be talking about biologics for lumbar fusion. Um, our topic is clearly just to really better understand the literature, as Dr. Chapman just said, understanding biologics to augment our lumbar spine fusion. And I'll start uh, with our first meta-analysis as we talked about. So uh, this is comparative clinical effectiveness and safety of bone uh, morphogenic protein versus autologous iliac crest bone graft and lumbar fusion. This was a meta-analysis in spine and uh, published in 2020. And it comes out of a group uh, at Fujian Medical University in uh, China. So as I mentioned before, it's a systematic review and meta-analysis really to evaluate the efficacy and safety of recombinant bone morphogenic protein versus the iliac crest bone graft. You know, as a little bit of background, iliac crest bone graft is really recognized as kind of the gold standard for lumbar fusion to augment. Uh, and the reasons to kind of look at other things are the rates of bony nonunion. Uh, there are donor site complications. There's um, sometimes insufficient harvest material for multi-segment fusions when we collect the elite crest. So any sort of augment uh, that could supplement that would be nice. And so that's why they were comparing that to the BMP. In this study, they looked at the assessment of fusion uh, that looked at ODI, the SF30, 36 scores, rates of adverse events, as well as reoperation, and just a kind of an overview of their study itself. So it was 20 randomized control trials that were included, 2,185 patients in total. These patients were anywhere from 18 to 80 years old. They were undergoing fusion for lumbar degenerative disease. And some of the exclusion criteria of these studies were patients with deformity, with fracture, tumor, infections, anything greater than a grade two spinal anesthesis, and then any, any um, study that had followed those less than 12 months. So here's just an overflow kind of flow chart of their study design and how it kind of shook out. But it was basically they did a study through PubMed, uh, uh, EM-based, Central. In total, there was uh, 1,118 uh, studies. The duplicates were removed, and then they, based off their exclusion criteria, um, they were able to dwindle everything down to about 20 included articles, that 2,000 uh, number of patients that I've mentioned just before. And the first thing that they looked at and kind of demonstrated was uh, looking at fusion rates. So this was BMP versus the Iliac Crest. And you can see that they broke things down based upon BMP2 versus BMP7. And the first thing they here have here is an odds ratio of 5.57 of increased fusion rate with BMP2. Uh, when they looked at it uh, in BMP7, they only uh, saw no difference at, with the odds ratio of 0 0.94. And in total, with the whole cohorts together, it was a odds ratio of 3.79. So, uh, and fusion was defined as less than 50% of radiolucent lines over the implants, as well as any translation less than three millimeters and any change in angulation less than five degrees on flexix. So first kind of... Um, outcome study looking at the fusion rate shows that it was a benefit with BMP. Next, they looked at some of the uh, patient reported outcomes, particularly in the ODI scores. Uh, again, in the overall cohort, it was an odds ratio of 1.54. Uh, 
Um, and then they broke that down again into the BMP2 versus BMP7 with an odds ratio of 1.94 and the BMP2 um, and then and BMP7 an uh, odds ratio of 0 0.19. They also looked, as I mentioned before, the comparison of the SF36. They found no difference when comparing those two groups with the mean difference of 1.16. Um, and then they looked at uh, numerical rating scores, uh, back pain, as well as leg pain. And they also found no difference with um, the mean difference being negative 0.05 uh, for the back pain and then negative 0.84 for leg pain. Uh, next, they looked at reoperation rate. So BMP versus Elliott Crest again. Uh, on the overall, they uh, found that there was a odds ratio of 0 0.59. So decrease operation with BMP. And uh, as seen before, they subgrouped everyone in terms of the BMP2 versus BMP7 studies. The BMP2 had a, a odds ratio of 0 0.48, which was significant. And the BMP7 had uh, an odds ratio of 1.18, which did not turn out to be significant. Uh, they also looked at adverse events and on the overall found that there was no uh, major difference here and the odds ratio were 0 0.91. And then uh, again, broken down based on different types of procedures. So an ALIF versus a posterior type procedure. And they found no difference in those at 0 0.78 and 0 0.93 respectively. Uh, here's just a funnel graph just to look at uh, sorry, a funnel plot looking at uh, whether there's any bias, uh, particularly looking at those adverse events, and they really didn't find too many. Uh, they also looked at the rates of uh, rate, rates of infection, and they only had four studies that included those, but the odds ratios of the BMP versus the like crest was 0 0.76. And again, they broke those two down uh, further into BMP2 and BMP7. Uh, lastly, they looked at uh, operative time, and so they found uh, a significant difference of uh, 0 0.23 with the uh, mean difference in terms of hours. And so, again, the subgroups of 0 0.27 in the BMP2 and then in BMP7, there was a 0 0.13. Uh, just in terms of they didn't have any uh, um, figures of it, but they also looked at the EBL and found no differences in nine of those studies. Um, and then length of stay also included nine studies, no difference in the mean uh, difference of negative 0 0.5, sorry, 0 0.52. And again, that delineation of the two subgroups of BMP2 and BMP, BMP7, I didn't find any differences there. So overall, this is a, sorry, I know this is hard to read, but they just had this as one of their figures. This is a kind of summary of all of their outcomes. And so um, just kind of the take home path, take on points here that BMP2 seems to be an effective fusion material, um, more effective than Elliott crest, Elliot crest bone graft even. Uh, and BMP2 may be superior in terms of fusion success, improvement of ODI, reoperation, operation time, length of stay, uh, but BMP7 has no significant advantage over the Elliott crest bone graft. They didn't find any differences uh, that were observed between BMP2 and Elliott crest regarding improvement of the SF36 and the um, NRS back pain, adverse events, or blood loss. And so their overall conclusion was that BMP2 um, is an effective substitute for Elliott crest bone graft in lumbar fusion. So overall, I think it's a, it's a good study. It's a good summary of all of our literature at that time of in 2020, and really looking at kind of the uh, randomized control trials in the literature and really trying to come together with a comprehensive review of the literature and seems to demonstrate that BMP has some effective role. Great job, Brian. Uh, nice summary of a, of a, you know, sort of big systematic review type article. Um, I guess uh, just kind of opening up to the panelists here, Dr. Nasser, you know, in your practice now, what's the role of iliac crest bone graft? Uh, do you still utilize it in certain situations or um, have you kind of gone away from using it? So I would say that, uh, you know, starting in my practice, probably 95% of fusions received iliac crest bone graft. And uh, now it's close, it's probably close to about 10%. So it's, it's been a market shift over the years. And primarily that's due to discussion with the patients, but it's also due to the patient population. I also think that what a lot of these studies uh, fail to talk about is just the health of our patients. So our patients are getting older. Uh, more osteopenic, more osteoporotic. And I, I do think that there's a challenge in harvesting enough good 
bone graft material when someone has underlying osteopenia or osteoporosis. And I think that's been the biggest shift in my practice. Um, and so I think that is another factor that contributes to whether or not iliac crest would be enough to get someone to fears uh, versus, you know, having to resort to BMP. But again, that shift in my practice has naturally just occurred over time. Uh, there is some morbidity from harvesting iliac crest. I don't think it's as bad as what the literature suggests. But uh, having said that, again, I think a lot of practices are shifting towards using bone graft substitutes, whether it's uh, BMP or, or alternative uh, uh, you know, bone grafts because of the morbidity slash uh, time that it takes to, to harvest, as well as possibly, possibly the patient population itself. And what about for you guys in Seattle, Jens, uh, are you guys um, still harvesting iliac crest autograft in certain situations or um, have you moved to mostly substitutes uh, in local autograft? This is a really uh, great uh, question and point. And this is a hot uh, button topic as everybody's trying to squeeze every healthcare dollar out of everything. And now that we have some epic tools to look at our cost structure, BMP sticks out like a sore thumb, uh, at least in the current uh, licensing uh, schedule. Um, I want to pick up what Ahmed just said. We made this assumption that iliac crest, autologous iliac crest graft is the quote gold standard, yet the actual variables are dramatic. The quality of graft harvesting, the safety, uh, talking about that, um, in terms of not causing further fractures um, or uh, causing substantial pain or, uh, God forbid, neurovascular trauma is really underreported. We don't actually understand what that is. So the devil's in the detail here, and it's uh, frequently overlooked, and that assumption of ICBG being the gold standard is really a problem. So. Uh, Stay tuned, we're all going to uh, face further scrutiny as our cost uh, and outcomes um, uh, results, but um, I, I welcome this. We, we obviously do, for larger surgeries, uh, rely on off-label BMP use uh, to augment fusions, and autologous iliac crest grafts are obtained on, a, um, on an opportunistic basis, and very much first preference is given towards adequate pelvic fixation, and we don't want to ruin that. And I think all of us have struggled when we did larger redos with extensive iliac harvesting like what's the good Henry Bowman used to do where the half of the backs of the pelvis is raided right Ahmed I mean you remember those uh, there was a a posterior hemipelvectomy done when he was uh, completed with his ICBG harvesting I have next to me Professor Schildhauer from Germany he's the chairman at the University of Bochum how's this in Germany how's this in another country are you allowed to use BMP to use iliac crest grafts well, we are allowed to use it, but it's a big hassle to get it. Um, we have to apply for it. The costs are not covered. Uh, certain insurances are only covering that. Therefore, we still rely on um, autologous and autogenous um, uh, bone graft and uh, hardly use BMP as you guys do it here. But it's a cost issue mainly. Yeah, I think I think we're going to all see it too. I mean, I talking to some of my friends who are on the East Coast. I think there's in certain practice uh, areas a lot of scrutiny now from the hospital and from payers uh, on using BMP um, and trying to shift towards um, options other than BMP uh, for use. And so I think you know we're going to talk about some other studies here uh, moving forward. And uh, I think that's a good segue uh, into Dr. Bernance's uh, next paper here which is the minimally effective dose of BMP in posterior lumbar antibody fusion, a systematic review and meta-analysis. So I'll let Jim take it away. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Sebastian. And thanks everyone for including me. My name is Jim Bernat. I'm one of the orthopedic spine surgery fellows here at the Mayo Clinic. I'll be joining the staff at the University of Wisconsin next fall. So I think this is a great opportunity to kind of piggyback on what Brian was talking about before we get into the other options for bone graft substitutes and extenders, looking more specifically at BMP, uh, this systematic review and meta-analysis, which was published in Spine in 2020, was specifically trying to find <coughs> an effective dose which would allow for optimal fusion rates while minimizing complications. And then similarly, they set out to find out, does the location of your BMP placement have an effect on your fusion rate or on your complications? So. They looked at all studies published after 2011, looking only at primary studies, not review studies. Um, they looked for studies that reported both fusion or complication outcomes, and they wanted to specifically track the BMP dose that was used per level. 
In this systematic review, they only used studies that used either a transforaminal lumbar or a posterior lumbar inner body fusion technique, excluding other techniques. They also excluded those studies with less than 15 patients and those that included pediatric populations. And for their statistical analysis, important to note, they used a random effects model, hoping to, um, to be able to um, work around the uncontrollable differences between studies, specifically the different comorbidities of the patients, the definitions of fusions, the skill levels of the surgeons doing the studies, et cetera. They looked at over 600 studies and ultimately included 22 in their systematic review. Of those 22 studies, most were retrospective case series, which is a limitation of this systematic review. They had some retrospective comparative, uh, two prospective case series, one prospective comparative, but only one randomized controlled trial. Looking now at the fusion rates, you can see their overall table that shows the study, the number of participants, the BMP doses, the fusion rate, and then the radiographic follow-up for these. So we'll delve into this a little bit more. Specifically for fusion rate, there was a trend toward increasing odds of fusion for BMP versus iliac crest bone graphs. So similar to what Brian found, but because there were fewer studies included in this, didn't get to the statistical significance necessarily that Brian's systematic review found. The pooled overall fusion rate was excellent though at 94%, but interestingly, the uh, range of BMP per level uh, was from 1.2 milligrams per level all the way up to 12 milligrams per level. So a 10 times difference in the amount of BMP being used in these studies. What about the complications related to BMP? So radiculitis, common BMP complication, this was reported in 12 of the studies, and it was indeed higher in the BMP group versus the controls. Uh, one we always talk about and think about with BMP is cancer. There were overall four total cases reported in these 22 studies, and they noted that this was not significantly different compared to the control group. <laughs> Looking at the BMP placement and its effect on fusion, there were 13 studies that specifically reported where they put the BMP. And you can see on the figure, their options were putting the BMP just in your cage, putting it in the cage in the posterolateral gutters, putting it in the inner space, but not within the cage, um, and then putting it uh, in the inner space as well as the posterolateral gutters. And this study found that the placement of the BMP within the interspace and the posterolateral gutter had the highest rate of fusion, um, notably radiculitis, heterotopic ossification, and osteolysis was noted in all locations. So it didn't really matter where you put the BMP in regards to complications arising. They tried to develop a meta-regression model to look specifically at the dose per level. However, they were unable to find any association of the fusion rate with the dose per level. So for their discussion, they noted that there was really no correlation of that BMP dose and fusion on their meta-regression. Uh, this specific group of authors had previously published a study using one to two milligrams per level, and they found no difference um, in fusion rates with higher doses. So their kind of conclusion was that you don't have any increased fusion with, uh, excuse me, with doses over one to two milligrams per level. For location of where to put the BMP, they noted that inner space plus the posterior lateral gutters gave you the highest rate of fusion. Radiculitis can occur with BMP in any location, and it didn't really matter the dose that it was put in at. And then interestingly, I thought this was nice. They looked specifically at studies that commented on using a barrier technique, which a lot of people kind of do clinically where you have to put allograft or DBM and kind of try to edge where you're putting your BMP to stop it from contacting any of the neural elements. But they noted that that didn't seem to help. Heterotopic bone was noted uh, regardless of the dose or of the location of BMP used or whether or not a barrier was used. So you can count on HO happening at some level. Osteolysis was a greatest risk if the BMP was placed within the cage. And I think that makes sense. If you're concentrating your BMP within the cage, then it's uh, not able to expand out as much and is going to be in close contact with the end plates where you can see osteolysis. Limitations of this study were that there was only one randomized control trial, high degree of detection bias. Um, for all of these studies, most of the outcomes were reported and investigated by the primary investigator of the study, which can result in bias. And there was inconsistent reporting of complications kind of across the board. Personal takeaways for me going forward would be that BMP, we know, of course, works, but it, it seems to work in low doses. And so there's not a lot of great data to support using any more than two milligrams per level. And this varies widely across, you know, here at the Mayo Clinic and widely across the country of the amount that people are using. Um, if you are going to use it, use it in the disk space and the posterolateral gutters if possible. 
Um, and as far as BMP complications, they seem to occur no matter where and how much you use. So you should be counseling all patients about those potential complications that can arise if you're planning on using it. Thanks. Yeah, great summary, uh, Jim. And, uh, you know, obviously, um, coming back to the cost issue, we know that kind of controlling the dose and um, trying to use the minimally effective dose is probably the best way to utilize BMP. Um, I think opening up to the panelists again, you know, Akba, do you have a specific uh, dosage that you aim for per level? Um, does it vary based on approach or the type of procedure? <clears throat> yeah, so I, I think there's a very different healing mechanism for the posterior lateral fusion versus the inner body fusion. And I do think the inner body space is actually uh, much more conducive uh, to achieving fusions with much lower doses of BMP. Uh, and so my typical is now that I don't use over two milligrams per level uh, and that it's uh, placed within the inner body space because, you know, I've got a friend that does a lot of research in this area and it's almost a tenfold difference to achieve a reliable posterior lateral fusion in an animal model uh, that he's using in the posterior lateral space versus in the inner body space. He can actually even get uh, much lower than two milligrams to fuse consistently uh, essentially within the inner body space. So again, that's shifted my practice a lot towards using smaller doses, either an extra small or an extra, extra small uh, uh, dose within the, within the cage, oh, sorry, within the inner body space. And that's actually been reliably getting me a, a very solid fusion in most patients and also decreasing the cost because now you're actually down to the cost of, of most of the other bone grafts that we have on the market uh, that you would be utilizing traditionally within the, within the inner body space. So. And for those longer constructs, you know, T10 to the pelvis, T2 to the pelvis, um, where we're not doing an inner body say at every level, what's your strategy there for posterolateral fusion? I think the strategy is to harvest as much local bone as we can. Uh, again, if you can opportunistically take some iliac crest, if the bone is a good quality, I think that's a reasonable strategy. I take a lot of bone from the lamina, try to use some of the older techniques that uh, uh, are still very valuable, feathering the lamina, creating vascularized surfaces everywhere we can. Uh, and then utilizing the BMP in locations that are more likely to develop a pseudoarthrosis. So at the top and the bottom of the construct, understanding that the mid portions of the construct often uh, are shielded uh, from some of those higher stresses and so are more likely to go on to fuse either way. So again, just selectively using the BMP in, in the areas where I think it matters most. Great. And for any of other panelists, uh, is, is anybody using a sealant uh, like to seal or Duraseal uh, when they are using BMP in the inner body space, particularly for Attila for a PLIF approach? If I may add to this, um, so the company in question, I don't know how to call them out, but everybody knows what I'm talking about, did provide a lot of dosing guides, which now in retrospect were really way over the top. And uh, that's again, something we just have to call out very clearly and being extremely cognizant um, how we use it, where we use it. I loved what Ahmed said, you gotta be very strategic about it. The other thing is in a transverse fusions, whilst it's, I'm using that word again, still a gold standard um, in many of our practices, um, is a very hostile area to try to get a bone actually to take and heal. This is not the same as an intervertebral space. Um, so the, the location and how we apply it, how we cover it with auto a bone graft is a big deal. Now let's go to the other sealant substances. They all cost money. And we do know that they interfere with bone healing themselves potentially. Um, uh, so uh, for instance, Surgicel or gel foam, there are several animal studies that have shown that they actually prevent uh, bone or are retardant towards bone healing. So yet again, there we hit uh, a, a problem area. As to the HO formation, that's a real issue. And again, keeping it away from uh, nerves uh, and uh, making sure that the BMP, which is as it should be covered by autograft uh, of some sorts or some bone graft, uh, that's probably the best sealant I can think of. But a lot of, as you can hear, these things are empirical. So it was nice to hear a larger scale scientific analysis to support that low doses, if properly deployed, actually work. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was always kind of told to do is uh, squeeze out the sponge. Um, I don't know if anybody's doing that because uh, I always worry that, you know, the BMP that's not adsorbed to that sponge is 
you know, has the potential to go anywhere. Um, I don't know if anybody else is doing that. Jens is shaking his head. Um, but that's always kind of been something I've done to hopefully help guard against, you know, radiculitis or HO. Have any of you uh, seen any sort of severe complications related to BMP, particularly with regards to post-op radiculitis that doesn't resolve? Um, I've been uh, always very cognizant of that. I've treated patients who have come to me with uh, exuberant bone overgrowth. This is something that we see far more in MIS patients, um, at least to my uh, observations. Again, that's anecdotal. Um, so this kind of a postulado outcropping of bone seems to happen far more when you have uh, BMP applied through small tubular structures. But um, again, I just put it as far away from my nerve uh, roots as possible and uh, cover it well with autograft. And uh, that seems to empirically have worked quite well. Ahmed, do you have any strategies that you employ to try to minimize the risk of BMP related complications? I think the, the best strategy is number one, to discuss it with your patient, because I think it, it is a real thing and it does occur. And and I, I tend to distinguish a BMP radiculopathy from something that I've caused with mechanical irritation to the root in that the patients with BMP radiculopathy often don't wake up with nerve pain. It's usually a few days or even a week or so uh, before they start complaining of this nerve pain. I image all of those patients to make sure, again, it's not a structural reason uh, that we haven't left bone graft in the frame. And, uh, but it, it, assuming that it's really a chemical irritation, I have seen it be so severe. Uh, I had one gentleman where uh, he was so adamantly against BMP that I had done iliac crest for three separate fusions on this patient, uh, a cervical fusion and a lumbar fusion, and then a redo lumbar fusion. I eventually came back about 10 years later if we didn't have any more iliac crest to harvest. And I finally used BMP on him, and he was the worst BMP radiculopathy I've ever gotten. No imaging study uh, showing anything compressing the root, but he had to go through effectively about a year's worth of desensitization therapy. So it can be se severe. Uh, eventually it did recover, but uh, I think you can seek chemical irritation of the nerve root, usually in a delayed fashion. If that occurs, I think you have to try to get them involved in uh, PT desensitization, uh, neuropathic agents, uh, possibly even a short course of steroids. Uh, to try to help them with their pain because it can, again, again, be quite severe when it occurs. And there's no rhyme or reason. I, I do my cases the same way every time, uh, but I'd say about 5% of patients usually end up with some form of radiculopathy that we end up having to treat. So, Yeah, all good points. I think the consent uh, point is really important too. I have a separate discussion uh, with every patient if I'm going to be using BMP. And then I think uh, from a documentation standpoint, especially since a lot of the uses are still off-label, um, I always make sure to document that discussion, uh, my preoperative note as well. Um, well, moving on uh, kind of from the BMP talk uh, to something a little bit different, I think uh, Dr. Goh's next article uh, is going to be on randomized uh, double-blind clinical trial of P15 versus allograft in non-instrumented uh, lumbar fusion surgery. So uh, Dr. Goh, why don't you take it away? All right, thank you. All right, so uh, as Dr. Sebastian just said, uh, so this is the, the randomized uh, double, uh, sorry, double blind clinical trial of ABM T15 uh, versus allograft and non instrumented fusions. This was published in the Spine Journal in 2020, and this comes out of a group out of Denmark looking at the study. So just to talk a little bit about uh, ABM and this P15. So it's an inorganic bovine-derived um, hydroxyapatite matrix. That's the ABM uh, combined with a synthetic 15 amino acid residue, which is part of the collagen uh, type 1. So here's just a little uh, sort of scheme and diagram demonstrating uh, parts of the collagen. And it's this really chain of 15 amino acids uh, that have been uh, shown to enhance cell proliferation, cell attachment, um, differentiation, and uh, enhance uh, osteogenesis. So they're comparing that. And so uh, the purpose of the study really was to assess the ABM, which is that anor anorganic bone min uh, mineral uh, with P15 and compare that to allograft, particularly in the non-instrumented lumbar fusions. Uh, their goals were really to measure the PROs and fusion rates. And so they, they mentioned that in Scandinavia, which is uh, this where this Denmark study happened, that particularly the non-instrumented lumbar fusions are quite popular, particularly in the osteoporotic patients. And so it was a double-blinded randomized controlled trial in Scandinavia. 
patients were 60 years or older with degenerative spondylolisthesis undergoing a decompression with a non-instrumented posterior lateral fusion. Uh, in terms of their methods, so they had the ABM slash P15 in a sort of 50-50 mix at five cc's per level, and that was compared against an allograph uh, using 30 cc's of uh, per level. And they took whatever autograph that they had from the actual decompression and combined that with those. Uh, overall, there were 49 patients in both of the cohorts, and this was a study collected from March 2012 to April 2013. Then, uh, as I mentioned before, all these patients had lumbar stenosis due to their degenerative diseases. In terms of the surgical technique, so there were nine surgeons in total. Um, they did the posterior lateral fusion technique with a transverse process decortication, which I think most of us uh, are familiar with. And then, as we said, uh, local auto bone graft um, was the only auto, sorry, was the only bone graft that was used, no iliac crest. Um, the allograft itself was 30 grams per level of fresh frozen femoral head. And then uh, the ABM slash P15 was the five cc's per level. And everyone post-op had a soft brace for three months. Uh, in terms of their outcome measures, they looked at the uh, VAS scales of their leg and back pain, as well as ODI and the Euro Quality of Life, the 5D study, uh, 5D survey. Uh, those uh, PROs were collected at both one year as well as two-year follow-up. And they also obtained a one-year CT scan uh, at follow-up for assessment of the fusion mass. And they define that as an osseous bridge over the intertransfer space of um, at least one of the signs. So here's just a, a big kind of table demonstrating the demographics and baseline data of their two cohorts. They found that there was overall no difference between those two cohorts, except for there was a slight difference in the mini mental status, uh, sorry, state exam, the MMSE score. They felt like it didn't have any true uh, um, implications in their study, but unfortunately I did find some small difference in those. Uh, and then here's a summary on the right of their perioperative data, uh, demonstrating there's really no difference between the, the two cohorts in terms of length of stay, operative time, uh, EBL, the amount of local bone that was used, uh, and then um, in terms of their no difference in the two cohorts in terms of the number of levels, either one level or two level fusions. And so just getting to their, their results a little bit. So the summary of the fusion data, looking at the um, one level, two level, and then uh, those two cohorts combined. So in total, they found that there was a significant difference in the fusion rates, particularly. Um, and when you look at in, in total, 50% versus 20% in the ABM slash P15 versus allograph. And when they broke this down into one level fusions, it was 41% versus 21% also a significant difference. And then in the two-level fusions, 61% uh, versus 32%, also uh, significant. And then just looking at their uh, patient reported outcomes. So these are diagrams showing the ODI on the left uh, in the, um, on the top line, and then as well as the uh, uh, Euro quality of life scores. The dark um, indicators here are the P15, and then the light ones are the allograft and showing no difference between those. And then also on the right, looking at the VAS back and leg pain scores, you can see here that there's really no difference between those two as well. All right. Um, and here is just kind of a, um, a table listing all of those different things and look at the uh, VAS back pain, leg pain, uh, ODI, no difference, and the Euro uh, QOL both at three months, 12 months, and at the, uh, the two-year post-op post mark. So overall, this is an interesting study that I think we're, we're starting to look at the other sort of um, lumbar fusion augments. The strengths of the study, I think that it's obviously a randomized control trial with a pretty homogenous cohort uh, in this uh, kind of Scandinavian uh, group of patients. They all had lumbar stenosis with degenerative spondylolisthesis, And uh, because of the way that their health system set up, Obviously, everyone has a very high follow-up rate, and so they could get good data from that point, even up to two years. Uh, limitations are obviously the lack of widespread use of the non-instrumented fusions, uh, particularly in the U.S. I feel like it's not as common as it would be uh, in these European countries, and uh, that certainly is a challenging environment for fusion with uh, non-instrumentation. 
And there was no consideration for the demineralized bone matrix or any um, other types of autograph, of course, uh, but that makes their data a, lot, a little bit cleaner in terms of no elite crest bone graph and only just the local bone graph. So really the take home points uh, are that the ABM P15 in combination with local, local autograph uh, increases the intertransverse fusion rates in patients undergoing one or two level in a non-instrumented fusion for a degenerative spondylolisthesis, and that there was no difference in patient reported outcomes in patients who underwent fusion with uh, the ABM slash P15 as compared to allograft. Nice job, Brian. Um... Interesting article, obviously, uh, you know, especially looking at non-instrumented fusions. Um, uh, I guess, uh, Ahmed, do you think there's any role in older osteoporotic patients for thinking about non-instrumented fusions, especially when I look at those fusion rates, you know, 60%, 30%, um, or uh, should we just not be fusing these people altogether? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I, I certainly think there's a role, and, and the paper is certainly an interesting paper. I don't have any obvious experience using this specific uh, uh, protein uh, that they're using here, but um, I think there are some things that make me just a little bit concerned about the data that's presented in the paper, although I'm sure they did their best job in trying to collect this. Is If you actually look at their absolute fusion rate in their one levels, it was actually lower than in their two levels which again is a little bit puzzling, right? Like if you would assume that your two level fusion rate should be lower, which you know brings about the question of just heterogeneity in general in all these patient populations. Again, you can have a 60 year old that's incredibly healthy and you can have a 60 year old that's osteoporotic. Uh, and I think that may impact things as well as it's impossible to blind the surgeons once they're actually doing the surgery, they're given a bone graft uh, to use. And so how clean they make that posterior lateral gutter may actually impact the fusion rate. But I think if you're dealing with an elderly patient with severe osteopenia or osteoporosis, and you feel that instrumentation is not really going to provide much benefit or may actually even harm them, I think they're really benefiting from the decompression. And maybe what you're getting by doing the posterior lateral fusion is just a stable pseudoarthrosis. Uh, and maybe that prevents them from uh, slipping further. And that's why there's actually some benefit in that. I certainly saw that in my training. I've done that occasionally in cases. Uh, but as a general rule, my thought is if I'm there, I'm going to try to put a screw in, right? Uh, because I know that the fusion rate is going to be a little bit higher. If I really feel that the screw is not adding any value, then I take it out because I think it, it could potentially cause harm. So, um, but that's just my philosophy on this. So, What about uh, for our group in Seattle, any um role for non-instrumented fusions uh, in your practice? Yeah, this has become very rare for the reasons stated. And uh, again, I've in my early years and looking at the Scandinavian literature, which dates back to two decades now, uh, they claimed um, uh, they claimed equivalence or equipoise, as we all know, in presence of a good decompression. In my hands, they pretty routinely fail. Uh, it's uh, pretty remarkable. So I'm not a nihilist about it, but it's just not worked. So hardware still has a very specific role. What I wanted to point out in this article from my end, my take, in addition to what Ahmed said, um, there is, uh, again, just a lack of standardization of how much graft of what type do we actually need to get a fusion. So the same question that applies to BMP applies to the bone graft material that we use. What's the critical mass? How do we reconstitute it? What kind of, for instance, allograft is better, uh, cortical derived, cancellous, um, et cetera. So there are multiple variables in this. I like that they had kind of a dose quantification effort. Uh, now, what's not clear in this is, was it reconstituted with autologous blood? Was an effort made to mix it, for instance, with uh, aspirated uh, blood from the retial bodies from the first pass of a pedicle screw? Things like that uh, may or may not matter. And ultimately, again, the graft site preparation and how we dissect the graft site uh, probably does matter substantially if the patient is a bone former or not. For me, humankind is divided into two categories of patients, bone formers and bone non-formers. And um, 
that's it. And recognizing that individual uh, responsiveness is a key towards success. So an AS patient will probably heal with two granules of dried up allograft from an 80 year old donor somewhere. Whereas a avid smoker um, on chronic non-steroidals uh, who happens to play in the NFL also and is totally jacked up may never form bone for reasons that we still don't quite understand. So just giving two examples. Uh, but dose quantification and how we put the bone graft in is uh, really important and uh, making a biologically viable nest for it that stays contained um, uh, with a biologically uh, potentially integrative uh, substance, that's the key to success. And I'd be curious to hear uh, what some of the panelists are using for volume. I mean, um, you know, we've got a great femoral head program here. Um, so we tend, I think both myself and Dr. Nasser probably use femoral head uh, allograft to provide us volume for our fusions. But I'm curious, um, do you guys have a specific uh, graft that you go to for volume yens or? Yeah, we use uh, commercially available um, allograft granules and we use usually the larger, the coarser um, material and not the fine grain because the fine grain just floats away. So keeping it contained on a practical basis seems to be important. Uh, local graft is something that we use a lot. We published on that with uh, a colleague named Rostagi. We actually histologically assessed it. We run our so bone mill. We use a bone filter system for aspiration of uh, drilling materials as well. And we found that there are literally no viable cells in our aspirate. We found a large number of um, BMPs actually in that. So there's a value in properly processed local graft and being very fastidious about that does seem to bear some merit, but yet again, there's costs in it. So that filtration system costs, um, just purchasing costs about $300 and the bone mill, that espresso bean cruncher from a certain large company um, costs another $280. So yet again, there are costs, but uh, in the big picture, local graft is still my preference and augmenting that with allograft on a not more than 50-50 basis does seem to give you a nice added volume package and getting a nice solid, uh, slightly compressed fill, for instance, the postal out of gutter or into your inner space, mechanically speaking, does seem to allow for that early on growth of fibroblasts, that attachment of fibroblasts that then can morph. Yeah, all great comments, all great comments. I think, uh, you yeah, know, the volume part's really important because I think sometimes we tend to focus on, uh, you know, BMP or, or, you know, P15 peptide, but if you don't have a good volume and pack of the disc space or post rattle space, I think you're going to fail. Um, moving on to our last article uh, by Dr. Bernantz. Um, this one is looking at the influence of age on the efficacy of DBM enriched with concentrated bone marrow aspirate and lumbar fusions. Um, Jim, why don't you take us away? Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so this gets at the point earlier that was brought up, is, you know, is iliac crest in an old person and a young person the same thing, both the volume and the quality of it? So I think this was a neat study uh, performed by Dr. Jeff Wang, published in 2018 clinical spine surgery um, with the title, Does Age Influence the Efficacy of DBM Enriched with uh, Bone Marrow Aspirate Concentrated BMAC in Lumbar Fusions? Um, so we know that BMAC has osteogenic and osteoinductive potential. And as compared to iliac crest bone graft, it's much easier to obtain. But we also know from a histologic standpoint that mesenchymal stem cell concentration and its osteogenic potential decreases as we age. So the purpose of this study was to evaluate the effect of age on the outcome of iliac crest bone graft compared with this DBM enriched with BMAC in patients undergoing posterolateral fusion. So this was a retrospective case control study that included all patients undergoing instrumented posterolateral fusion over an 11 year period by the senior author. And they were divided into two groups. They either got iliac crest bone graft for their posterolateral instrumented fusion, or they got BMAC plus DBM. They excluded patients that got other bone graft materials like BMP2, and they excluded those that had any inner body fusion. With those patients, they divided them into three groups. Now try to, to parse out the age feature. So group A was elderly patients, which they said was over 65, who got BMAC and DBM. Group B was patients younger than 65 who got BMAC plus DBM. And then group C was the control. And this was older adults over the age of 65 uh, who received only iliac crest bone graft. And they talked about their methods for their bone marrow harvest. 
they use a three-ported jam sheeting needle and their goal was to get a three times aspirate volume to the graph material volume. And then they used a company specific uh, selective cell retention system to spin that bone marrow aspirate down. And then for iliac crest bone graft, they described their technique, which is just a standard open posterior crest harvest. Uh, they graded their fusion on x-rays using the Lakey classification. Um, we all know this has its downfalls, uh, grading fusion on x-rays, but they defined it as definitely solid, possibly solid, probably not solid, or definitely not solid. And here are their results. So here you see comparing the three groups, group A, is the older adults with the BMAC, group B, the younger adults with the BMAC, and group C is the controlled iliac crest. And now, interestingly, if you look at the age of those groups, so the older group, the mean age was 74 versus 52 for the younger group. So a 22 year age difference here. So really different groups demographically in that regard. And similarly, their Charleston comorbidity index, as you would expect, was almost four for the older group and 1.5 for the younger group. So definitely a different population based on that. But otherwise, they show that their surgical factors, the levels of fusion, hospital stay, blood loss, et cetera, was all similar between the groups. And then here are their results for their radiographic fusion. So you'll see in the older adults getting the bone marrow aspirate only 35% with a solid fusion versus younger adults with the bone marrow aspirate, 76% solid fusion. And then the gold standard control of the iliac crest had an 80% uh, solid fusion, even in these older adults. <clears throat> so when you compare the older adults getting bone marrow aspirate or the older adults getting iliac crest, um, this bone marrow aspirate had significantly higher odds of having a non-solid fusion. Uh, group C or group D, and specifically 28% of them had an obvious pseudoarthrosis. Their complication rates overall were the same between groups. Their reoperation rate was the same between groups. Uh, and interestingly, just like Brian studied, despite the differences in fusion rates, the clinical outcomes were equivocal between the groups. So in their discussion, they go on to say that the elderly patients undergoing posterolateral fusion using the BMAC with DBM had lower fusion success compared to the non-elderly and compared to elderly receiving iliac crest bone graft. As I said, this is another example where fusion success does not necessarily equal clinical success. Limitations of this study are many in that it was a single surgeon, retrospective, small sample, not randomized. Uh, and specifically, what I would have liked to have seen is a quantification of some of those osteoprogenitor cells. You know, they used the age of the patient as kind of an ad or a stand in for really the health of the bone marrow aspirate, which I think is appropriate, but it would be nice to see some qualitative and, or excuse me, some quantitative analysis of the stem cells that they were getting for their bone marrow aspirate. Personally, what I take away from it is that the bone marrow aspirate with DBM is not effective for adults over the age of 65. So in that population, you need to consider using iliac crest graft or using BMP, which we've seen in earlier studies today to be successful in those age groups. However, in a younger age group, the bone marrow aspirate with DBM can achieve fusion at a high rates in these younger, healthier people. So perhaps this is a population of people where you don't need to waste necessarily the higher costs of a BMP or the morbidity of an iliac crest harvest if you can get a good fusion um, with less there. Thanks. Nice job, Jim. Uh, as you pointed out, obviously this paper is a little bit limited in terms of sample size, but I do think it brings up uh, something that seems to be more popular recently, which is using bone marrow uh, aspirate. Um, Ahmed, any experience using BMA in your practice or any thoughts about maybe its role in, in augmenting fusion? So uh, honestly, I, I don't uh, use it frequently. Uh, I have uh, an intermittent uh, fashion, but not enough to be able to give you strong data. It's, I think the paper is interesting. I mean, honestly, it, it doesn't uh, tell me something that I don't probably wouldn't have already expected, which is young patients need less diffuse, right? And so we, we clearly see that the bone marrow aspirate is probably not enough uh, to get enough viable cells to take a hostile environment and, and make it fuse well. Uh, so maybe that tells us that the cells that you're actually trying to get really need to be harvested in the tissue, right? So the iliac crest bone within that cancellous bone, you've got some osteoprogenitor cells that are not gonna be available to you if you just aspirate alone. Uh, and we know that, again, as we age, that the number of these osteoprogenitor cells goes down, especially as we have uh, osteopenia or osteoporosis. Again, 
the special interest of our group looking at that uh, specifically just kind of health of the spine in terms of the bone quality and whether or not fusion is going to be successful. But from that data that we have in our group, it, it suggests that you know, osteopenia and osteoporosis are part of this challenge. As, as Jens mentioned earlier, uh, there are some young patients that have a hostile environment too for other reasons. But as we age, I think that hostile environment is being generated primarily because of our lack of these progenitor cells available to us to make a uh, bone. So, uh, but an interesting study nonetheless. And, uh, uh, you know, I've taken away some, some good points from it. So. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm curious if they had just done DBM plus local autograft in the younger cohort, what if that would have been enough as well? Um, Jens, are you using uh, bone marrow aspirate in your practice in, in any fashion? Uh, no, not really. Again, there's a substantial cost involved with the proper aspiration techniques and uh, then spinning down and filtration. So this was, again, something where disposable surcharges that are non-pass-through costs are uh, not insignificant and make this uh, of suspicious comparison moreover since you had to have not just local graft but a substantial additional bone graft substance in there so this is again an interesting phenomenon and again i go back to the fact that the same author jeff wong and i'm a total jeff wong fan obviously uh, also taught us that if we aspirate from our first pass from vertebral cannulation we actually get very nice osteoprogenitor cells out of that um, so without much cost at UW, we routinely harvested that. We had a special little setup for that without any big costs outside of a syringe and a little kind of a rubber stopper. I stopped doing that right now, but I may restart that after seeing that it does make a difference and you just have to have a very little um, uh, jury rigged setup for that. So we don't have to necessarily go into the pelvis crest to do this. And as um, Ahmed said earlier, an opportunistic bone graft from the pelvis, there's nothing wrong with that, but let's not go crazy with buying additional spin down and filtration and centrifuge sets. I think that's just where this gets a little bit crazy. It's just become an anachronism. But it's an interesting topic in understanding the bone physiology of growth and what all leads to that uh, is nicely underscored by the insights of this article. Yeah, I think all... Yeah, sorry, let me ask my German colleague. Yes. Do you know that? No, we don't. Again, uh, cost-wise is an issue. We used it in the technique in the Elisa of uh, techniques um, for fusion at the distal um, uh, tibia, and it worked there very well in younger patients. We know that, but again, then due to cost issues, we don't really use it. There's no, no um, win for us in that. Let me ask our ISSG colleague, Dr. Hart, who's joined us. Uh, can you take that microphone? T take this one up front. Uh, so ISSG, any uh, uh, thoughts on long fusions and uh, bone marrow aspirates, allograft, uh, local graft, um, and off-label BMP? Yeah, I, I don't use bone marrow any longer. I did, uh, back in the day, uh, Depew J&J &J had a, a bone marrow concentrate product. It was pricey, uh, obviously cheaper than BMP. Um, I, uh, I am a big BMP proponent and user. Um, I um, certainly advocate it in long constructs, and I think the ISSG data supports that. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't think that we have standardized dosage for that, but, uh, but it certainly is uh, an, effective, um, an effective augmenter of uh, fusion. And, um, I've gone now to some the uh, DBM strand or D, D, uh, demineralized bone strands rather than particulate, uh, and I think the data supports that. I think I've stayed away from the more expensive, uh, unproven technologies, and I would add to the list uh, the cell-based products, which I think are proving to not really add much value and do certainly add a lot of expense. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the cell-based products because um, certainly those have been a little bit more popular recently. Uh, and, um, you know, a lot of hospitals, I think, are trying to push them as a sort of a BMP alternative. Ahmed, any thought on some of these cellular-based sort of mesenchymal cell products like um, Vivigen or Osteo uh, Cell or any of those? Yeah, as, as Dr. Hart uh, mentioned, I think the, the science right now is lacking in the even though a lot of these companies tout that they have, uh, you know, um, 
uh, certain minimum levels of concentrations of these cells. We don't actually know how many of those cells you actually need to effectively get a fusion. Uh, and we get into uh, cost uh, ranges that are very similar, if not exceed what the BMP cost would be. So if I can use a very small amount of BMP uh, in an off-label fashion in the inner body space, that's much more likely to get me a fusion, I think, uh, than uh, some of these uh, more costly cell-based products. Uh, and so I've, I, I haven't really adopted using them. Uh, again, I think there's some good basic science that suggests that they do work, but from our uh, basic science researchers, we know that the concentration of these uh, products really does matter. And what I worry about is how do these cells stay alive? Uh, and you know, especially in the environments that we put them in the operating room where from the time of that preparation of that product to the time of use is variable. Uh, the uh, preparation can be variable, et cetera. You know, how, how do you actually ensure that even though there's a certain concentration when they first sell that to you, uh, that it's really still there and those cells are actually viable by the time you need to use them, so. May, may I add to that? So this is piling on to Ahmed. We, we have a pernicious uh, a kind of a, a culinary of thought here, I must admit. So um, the uh, when, there are several investigations that I don't think were actually published for a variety of reasons, but the inconsistency of cell counts in these products was dramatic uh, and has not been standardized. So whatever the glossy brochures uh, promise, um, this is actually not consistently checked and at, not at all standardized. Uh, so, uh, and there's so many questions like viability of these cells uh, ex vivo and the survival rate of the surviving cells in the new host is also very much in question. So this is truly an example of something where there was a lot of huff created with actually too many variables to be really uh, scientifically accountable. So this is something that our hospital system, for instance, just gone away from basically, and um, a strong industry uh, interest in uh, supporting these high expense biologics uh, remains unabated, however. So uh, I, I totally agree with uh, this being a, a great learning point in terms of how we should remain critical and remain true to good standards of uh, a solid surgical technique. And there's uh, not a magic potion that will create the desired fusion. What I remain fascinated by is this a conundrum of patients who have actually pretty good outcomes. And this goes back to the famous Harry Herkowitz study. Uh, and they didn't have a really solid fusion. And for me, this is again, just fascinating. Sometimes the neurologic prevalence of symptoms, the activity expectations of patients, as well as the quote stability or stability of a fibrous union seems to matter just as much as anything else, even if there's maybe not a perfect uh, grade four level fusion. So uh, that's still one of those many fascinating aspects of spine care for me. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, even in the um, Swedish randomized control trial, looking at fusion versus not fusion for um, you know grade one spondies, they showed that the back pain improved even with decompression alone in in those patients so obviously we have a lot still to learn about all of this um i think we're getting close to um kind of the time here so i just wanted to thank everybody for um a great journal club today and um jens and the rest of the group at seattle science foundation for having us no, it's been a privilege and honor, and we learned a lot. I learned a lot. I appreciate our TBI colleagues to be there. I was going to call upon them to see how the uh, uh, ASC environment handles high cost uh, things there, but nobody raised a hand there when I texted them. But I really appreciated this uh, effort and the quality of the articles and the discussion. So thanks for this valuable contribution, and it'll be much viewed. Uh, so uh, everybody stay safe and well. Arjun and us are join us at our Seattle Science Eighth Annual Trauma Forum this weekend. So Friday night, so tonight and tomorrow, all day we have uh, all stars. Uh, none from Mayo this year, but next year. Uh, but we have great topics and great speakers like Professor Schultower next to me. So thank you for doing this great program, Mayo. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.